So now we move on to making the system bootable. And the first thing we're going to do is to create an FS tab file, which we're now going to edit. And what we do here is put in the partitions as we created them initially. So the first one we're going to put in is SDA3, which is our root partition. It's a type ext4. Leave the rest of the line as it is. The swap, uh, I'll do that in a moment. Let's do the boot partition, which is slash dev slash sda1. That's mounted at boot. It's also an ext4. And I'm going to set a no auto option here so it doesn't automatically get mounted. So that's just a little bit of protection in case something goes awry with the file system. And I'll set the dump and system check order to one and two. And we can go on to the swap file, which is slash dev sda2. And the remainder of that doesn't need to be changed at all. So that should be sufficient. So I'll save that. Move on to the Linux kernel now. So we need to change back to the sources directory, extract the Linux kernel. change into the directory and the first thing we do is to make MR proper to clean the output directory. Now there's a menu driven command here but what we'll do first is we'll create a default config using this command here and that's created it based on the architecture. We'll now run this command here to go into the menu system and we'll just We'll accept all the defaults. Um, we'll just check some of these features here that have been mentioned, um, which are obviously important for the Linux from scratch, as it says in the system might not work correctly. So presses the type and features. The first one we'll look for is build a relocatable kernel, which I believe is down the bottom somewhere. Yep, there it is. It's already set. In fact, we can't unset it. Randomize the kernel, that's all set as well. So that's fine. General setup, compile the kernel with warnings as errors, that's checked. So we'll unset that as they specify here. Enable kernel headers through syskernel. So let's look for that one. So that's not checked anyway, so that's fine. Uh, General architecture dependent options. We need to ensure stack protector buffer overflow detection is set, which it is. Strong stack protector, which it is set, so that's fine. Device drivers, graphics support, which is normally about a page or so down. And we need to go into frame buffer devices. Uh, which is near the bottom, I believe. Yep, there it is there. Support for fray buffer devices we need to set. Uh, do we need to go into it? Console. Not sure we need to set anything there. Come out of that and go to console display driver support and enable frame buffer console support which is already checked as well. So that's fine. Next we go to generic driver options. Oh, which is under device drivers. So let's look for that generic driver options. That may be at the top, I think. Yeah, I think it's at the top. Oh yeah, there it is. So support for you event helper has got to be unchecked. Maintain a dev temp FS file system is checked and auto mount dev temp FX FS is also checked. So that's fine. 
So we'll go down here. Um, enable some additional features if you're building a 64-bit system. If you're using menu config, enable them in the order of config PCI MSI first. So we need to go to device drivers, PCI support, and enable PCI message signal interrupts. There it is. So that's already set. And IO MMU. which is under device drivers. That's near the bottom somewhere, I think. Yep, there it is, and that's already set as well. Go into it and look for support for Intel IO MMU. Yep, that's already set. And lastly, we go to processor type and features and check for support. X2 APIC support there it is there and we need to check that as well and that should be it the only other thing to do is under drive device drivers is to enable a network device and for this virtual box um, i don't know if you notice if we come out of it when we ran one of the commands uh, one of the network commands i can't remember which one it was now Let's see if we can find it. IP link, was it that one? No. Not that one either, maybe I miss, misread something. Uh, gone back too far. Oh yes, this is it, yes. So under the device rules you can see that the network device is E1000 so that's actually the name of the module that's loaded um, I don't know if we can do this mod oh yes it's at the bottom there you see that's the name of the network device that the virtual box uses so what we can do if we go back into menu config is we go into device drivers and then look for network devices which is there network device support and we want to then go into ethernet driver support oh looks like they're all being built um, it's actually unnecessary to build this many we just need to build the one that's required I'm not sure if there's an option to set all of these to no or not. If anybody knows if there is, I'd be happy to hear from you. Right, it's one of these Intel devices. I think it might be that one. Yep, E1000. So that's the option we need to keep. We can get rid of that one and the others. They're just unnecessary. It's just going to increase the kernel size and increase the compile time. If you do want to go through the kernel, there are probably other hardware drivers that you can get rid of if you know you're not going to need them. Uh, as I say, it will decrease the size of the kernel and certainly decrease the time it takes to build the kernel as well, which may be advantageous. Right, that's all done. So let's just check we've got that correct one installed. Yep, E1000. So that looks like that's all the configuration we need to do. We run make to build it.
Okay, that's built. Next thing to do is to install the modules. Um, next, it says about whether we've created a boot uh, partition or not, which we have. Um, now, it does say it's supposed to be mounted within the truth directory, but as you can see, we're in the truth and it does know that boot is mounted separately, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, so what we need to do now is to copy the kernel image into that directory, that partition. So if I now do df minus h, you can see that it's, it's increased in size. That shows that it is uh, mounted correctly. We copy the system.map file and also create a copy of the config file as well. Install some documentation and copy some more documentation there. And there's lots of information there about reason why we don't use user source Linux pointing to the source directory. Um, oh yes, one important thing, if you're going to keep the directory for the kernel is to ensure that it's owned by root. So I'm going to run that on the sources because it's worth keeping them in case you need to adjust something. Maybe you add a bit of hardware, you need to enable that in the kernel, recompile it. There's something there about the kernels, module loading. If you need to, if you've got a module that doesn't load automatically, you maybe need to load it manually or um, enable some options on the module. It gives you some information there about that. Now we're going to run grub to set up the actual boot part, um, which actually starts the computer. It gives details here about creating a rescue file. Uh, I'd never find this really necessary because we've already booted from a live image, um, which can be used again to uh, boot. If the system becomes unstable or doesn't boot, we can use the live image to boot from and then mount the uh, Linux from scratch partition to do any editing or changes if it doesn't boot. So the next thing we're going to do is grub install dev sda. This is the command we need in this environment. We've only got one disk. If you've got multiple disks, double check to ensure um, that you are going to run this on the correct disk. This will actually install boot code and overwrite anything that already exists there. So, yep, that's worked. Uh, if you're using EFI, as it says here, it's a slightly different command. Now we're going to create a config file so boot can, uh, sorry, grub can identify what it needs to boot and which partitions to use. Um, we need to make some changes here to the root. This specifies which partition is the root partition. Now this is the root partition as grub sees it to get access to the kernel. It's not the root system of the LFS system. So if I edit this file, um, in fact, if we do an F disk minus L, first of all, we can see that our root partition is the, uh, sorry, the boot partition is the first partition. So that's important because we need to set this partition, which is on HD zero, it's the first partition. So we need to change that to a one. And also, because it is a boot partition, we don't need to specify boot because the kernel is effectively on the root of the boot partition. We also need to change the root. So this is the root of the Linux system. We need to change that to three because that's the partition number. And that should be enough to get the system booted. So I'll save that. As it says there, the kernel files are relative to the partition used. Because we've got a separate boot partition, the kernel is in the root of that boot partition. And some more information there about using UUIDs, which can be useful uh, on occasions. Uh, yeah, there's a warning here about using grub make config that will overwrite this configuration file we've just created. So you never want to run that in an LFS environment.